Hello, everybody. So I just want to say thanks for you all for coming through for this event that we've got tonight. We've got a couple more people coming through, come through. Um, so yeah, we've got a couple of presentations for you. So we've got one from PRS and one from PPL. Uh, for anyone who don't know, um, I'm Yasin al Ashrafa. I'm the boss of HQ Familiar, HQ Recording Studio and HQ Can. So HQ Can is a community interest company and we do artist development. We help people make music, turn, this, turn it into a business and a profession. So some of the stuff that people need to know is around the topics we're going to cover today including myself, because I've got a record label, and I'm not going to lie, but this stuff is super complicated, you know, and sometimes I think I know it, and then someone asks me a question, I'm like, oh, I don't know, do I know that? So copyrights, all this kind of stuff is is a little bit, it's, it's a lot, you know, and sometimes it's, it's hard to remember it all. So I thought, let's get a presentation for us, also for some of the people on our project, some of them are in the room, and yeah, we're going to film it as well, so we can put it on the internet, but... First, I'm going to introduce someone from PP, PPL, PRS. So there's the three different things all covered. And she's going to explain a little bit about what happens here, what PPL, PRS does, and then we're going to get into the presentation. So, Alex, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so my name is Alex. I'm the PR and communications manager here at PPL, PRS. Um, so we've been here in Leicester for five years, and for those of you who don't know, we're a joint venture that was formed by PPL and PRS for Music um, to manage all the licensing um, for businesses who play music. So anything from hairdressers, um, shops, hospitality, all the way up to huge concerts, festivals, Glastonbury's, that type of thing, they all need a music license. Um, and what we do is we license those venues and we are completely not for profit. So we take our operating costs off and after, um, after those costs are taken off, the money goes back to PPL and PRS for Music as royalties and then it gets paid out to musicians. So what that means for, for you guys is that if you are a member of PPL or PRS, the money that we bring in from license fees from licensing a pub down the road who are playing live music or background music or a jukebox or somebody who's got sport on their TVs in a pub, um, we, the money that they pay us for a license fee, it eventually comes back to you artists if you're registered. So that's basically what we do here. Um, like I said, we've been here for five years. Um, there's, we've got a huge amount of musicians who, um, who work for us. Um, so that's, they're all really passionate about what they do. So that's why we work with Yasin and HQ. So we've got a partnership with Yasin as well. Um, and we help with um, a couple of the guys um, to allow them studio time. And we also uh, um, offer some flexible working for some of the musicians um, who work with Yasin so that they can continue to make music, but also earn a really good wage. Um, so that's kind of what we do. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping as well while you're all here. Um, so there's no fire alarms planned at all. So if you do hear a fire alarm, it means there's a fire. Um, so the nearest fire escape is around that corner. If you just go through the door, down the stairs and out round to the front of the building. And also the toilets are just around there. So if you need them, um, just pop, pop around there. And pretty much that's it and have a great time. Their bar is there, go and help yourselves. There's food that will be available afterwards as well. And then obviously we have, we've got um, a performance from, from Harry and Matt at the end as well. Thank you. So before we get into the first presentation, I'm just going to say, if you've got questions, there's pens, there's paper on your tables. If you want to write them down, you can do. Because what we're going to do, we're going to go through the two presentations, a little quick panel, and then we're going to do Q&A with everyone, and then we're going to try and wrap up so there's some networking. Obviously, we've got rappers, singers, producers, a lot of people in the room, so you can all network with each other. But so yeah, we're going to so save your questions till the end, and we'll let you know. But first up, we've got the legend Stuart Belsham. Here we go. Over to you. Thanks, Yasin. What a nice uh, introduction. Right, we're just tech bits here. Cool. Okay. Thank you very much. Right, good afternoon everyone, or good evening everyone. Um, so this is very quick, we've got 15 minutes. I traditionally don't do things quick, so I'm, apologies if this is all comes out as a garbled nonsense. Um, I'm going to get my clicker. 
So I'm Writer Relationship Manager at PRS for Music. Um, my role at PRS predominantly is dealing with emerging artists and those artists that already have a sort of a high profile. But everyone has to start somewhere. And obviously we're keen to get people to sign up and join sooner rather than later. So this set of slides is really just to give you an overview of um, what we as an organization do, but also we're gonna start with a few slides on copyright. So it's so important to understand copyright because that basically pulls together everything that we do and it enables everyone who's looking to make money from their music the ability to do that. So the first few slides are purely just on copyright. Okay, so what is copyright? Um, it, I mean, obviously, we could go into great detail. This is not going into great detail. So copyright is um, a means of protection um, for owners of creative works. Obviously, uh, in the capacity that we're talking about, we're talking about music, but it applies to all, all forms of creative work, liter literary, film producers, etc. Um, as a rights owner, you have the rights to basically to say to how your music is being used. So, so to authorize or grant permission to how to your music is used. There are a number of restricted acts restricted to your use. Um, they are the six points that are down there. The top three are generally bundled together and is what's referred to as the performing right. And the bottom three are bun when bundled together is generally what's referred to as the mechanical right. Um, the most important thing is, as a rights owner, you have the ability to make money from your music. Um, if anyone wants to use your music, they basically need your permission to do so. You can grant a license to do that, and in granting a license, there basically can be a fee. And as Alex explained at the start, that's basically what PPLPRS does on behalf of those organisations. They're granting licenses, um, ensuring that the rights owners um, receive the, the, the royalty that they're entitled to when their music is being used. Okay, so there are two main music copyrights. There's the copyright in the underlying work. So um, these are sort of referred to as authorship rights, but there's the um, copyright in the lyrics and there's copyright in the music. So if you're a beats maker, any music that you make, is you own the rights in that. If you collaborate on that, then you co-own those rights, similarly with regard to lyrical content. Um, then there is the rights in the actual sound, under, in the sound recording. Um, so therefore, you can have one copyright in a work, i.e. the underlying musical composition, but there can be numerous copyrights in various sound recordings because every time a new sound recording comes about, it will therefore generate a new, co um, a new copyright. Um, in the UK, there are two main organisations that take care of administering those rights on behalf of the owners, and they are PPL and PRS. Oh, I've jumped a little bit. There you go. PPL and PRS. Um, they are... The um, and basically dependent on who you are will determine and how your music is being used will determine which organisation you need to join. And for anyone going down the DIY route, generally you need to consider joining all of those organisations. Um, so as you can see there, you've got the you've got the creatives join PRS. You've got those that own the actual rights in the masters or have performed on a recording, then they should join PPL. Um, okay, so let's look at this in a little bit more detail. You have to excuse the uh, timings here. I'm just going to put it all up and then we'll go for it. Okay, so firstly on the left-hand side, PRS for Music. So PRS for Music actually work, um, operates on behalf of two separate organisations. They operate on behalf of the Mechanical Copyright Protection Society, which is MCPS, and they operate on behalf of themselves, which is PRS, the Performing Rights Society. Now, as you can see there, the, the reason why it's easy for that to do is because both of those separate organisations, MCPS and PRS, represent the same rights owners. They represent those people that are creating music in any form. Um, the and, but they are two separate organisations, therefore there are two separate um, applications that you would need to complete if you needed to join both organisations. To be honest, in my experience, most... Um, 
particularly new and emerging songwriters will join PRS before they join MCPS. PRS acts on behalf of the, or administers the royalties with regard to the public performance of the song. So whether that's through live, through radio, through TV, in general live, so at hotels, restaurants, bars, etc., or also for streaming. MCPS, um, the, role, the, the rights that they're administering is re when those same works have been copied or reproduced into a recording. So basically, traditionally, it's through MCPS. Is, MCPS is how songwriters receive royalties um, when a product was sold in the shop. So you go into HMV, if, you, if your song has been used on a recording, Basically, anyone who's purchasing that, the, what would have been then vinyl, and I suppose it is still now vinyl, um, then they would have um, got their royalties through joining MCPS. Because remember, the songwriter is not necessarily the same person as the artist that will have the deal with the record label. Okay, so um, one thing for those of you that can see and can read the small print, you'll notice that streaming is split between mechanical and performing. So therefore, for the songwriter to receive street, the full potential for ro streaming royalties, they need to be a member of both PRS and MCPS. Therefore, if you're only a member of MCPS and not a member of PRS, uh, sorry, if you're only a member of PRS and not a member of MCPS, and your works are generating substantial royalties for streaming, then you're not getting the whole packet, unless, and there is, there is a big unless, unless you have signed a deal with a music publisher. Once you get to that point in your career, when you sign a deal with a music publisher, then all your mechanical income is dealt with via the publisher. But for anyone who's doing the, going down the DIY route, for anyone who's not yet looking to get in, you know, I was going to say get into bed, but sign a deal with a publisher, then um, obviously you know you need to consider joining separately. Okay, so now a little bit on PPL. I'm going to really skim through this because John's going to cover this. Who can join PPL? So basically, anyone who owns the rights in the recording or anyone who's performed on the recording. Um, it doesn't cost anything to join PPL, it's free, right? But you just need to consider whether you're joining as a rights owner, whether you're joining as a performer, or whether you're joining as both. Um, okay, and PRS, well, as said, it's the creatives. So anyone who's producing beats, anyone who's writing lyrics, anyone who's uh, in a band, etc., anyone who's basically creating those songs, then they need to join PRS as well as music publishers, but we won't get into that. Um, okay, so PRS, um, recently, in March, we reduced our admission fee. For those of you that joined, you may have paid £100. We're now trying to do whatever we can, what we can to support and nurture the sort of new artists coming through. So therefore, the fee has now been reduced down to £30 for anyone under the age of 25. So anyone in the room who's under 25 who's not a PRS member should and is at that point where their music is being subject to public performance really should consider joining. Um, it's a great opportunity. Um, MCPS is still £100 to join. Okay, so as a member, you have full access to the to the sort of uh, the member area of our website. Everything once you join, everything that you manage, everything you do is through our website, um, and which is prsformusic.com. So the next set of slides is really just to it's basically it's going to sort of for those of you who are not yet members, hopefully give you an idea as to the type of things you should be doing. And for those of you that are members, hopefully it's going to be a refresh or a reminder as to what you should be doing. So firstly, as a member, there are a variety of different sort of services that are available. We're just going to touch on a few of them. The first one is probably the most important thing, registering your, your works with us. So once you've joined, you don't need to upload your music with us. What you do need to do is register your song titles with us. Um, and the process of doing that is via your online account. You simply go onto the home page, which here's an example of, and you would select the register or amend works button. Now, if you have signed a deal with a publisher, then the publisher will generally take full responsibility for maintaining the, this side of things. But if you're not with a publisher, then you will need to do this yourself or through it, whoever does it for you. Um, once clicking onto that, you'll get onto a five-page, uh, basically, 
section of, of, of registration. Um, I'm just going to go through the first two. So basically the first page, this is half of it, but this is the important bit. There is only one mandatory field, song title. So you just tell us what your song title is, and then you can move on to the next stage. I would always advise that you tell us what the duration is as well, but for most of you, but we do get a lot of questions, a lot of questions from people that are stuck at this point. Because there are a lot of boxes, those questions are, what do I put in this box or what do I put in that box? Well, you don't need to worry too much about it. You just need to ensure that you give us the song title and you give us the duration. I suppose the only point I would say is if your song could, put, um, if the title of your song could be written in any other way, then provide us with an alternative title. The way that all of our the business works is that we have to, we receive a lot of reporting in for all the businesses that are using music. So all the streaming platforms tell us what's being streamed. The radio stations tell us what what you know what the playlists are, what music is being played, um, etc. But where the challenges lie is identifying that information that we've re received from the re um, from the users and comparing it to the song registrations so therefore if it's potential if you know if you possibly a song could be written in a different way give us an alternative title so for example mate if you write mate with an eight emma whatever it is then also write it you know i was gonna say properly but write it in the way that an old person would write it like me um okay so that's basically registering your work then you come on to share information this is the bit that you really need to make sure that you've spoken if you've collaborated on the creation of a work then you need to ensure that between you you've agreed what the share splits are going to be um, and when you're re registering you're registering your contribution so if you're in a i don't know if you collaborated say you're the you're the lyricist and you've collaborated with a producer and you've agreed a 50 50 split then when you register, you're registering your 50%, and then the producer will have to then register their 50%. Um, what I would also say is, I mentioned that most newer artists will only will join PRS before MCPS. You'll notice from these two boxes, there's a box there, performing share, and a box mechanical. It doesn't say PRS share or MCPS share. It's simply asking whether what the percentages are for performing a mechanical. So regardless of whether you are an MCPS member, you should always enter the share in the, MC, in the mechanical box. So therefore, if you've agreed a 50 split with your co-writer, you would put 50% in the, in the uh, performing and 50% in the mechanical. If you don't do this, then we will potentially not be able to um, ensure that you receive royalties for streaming. So it's crucial that you do that. The other thing to state on this is if you've collaborated you, it is feasible for one person on behalf of all of the people that have co-written co the work to register on their behalf. You'll notice that there's an add writer box, so you could add the other people. That's fine if you do that, but every party has to confirm or authorise their own share. So everyone will need to at least get in and just move through those five stages and hit the send button on the fifth stage to say that they're in agreement with what their co-writers have registered on their behalf. Again, if this is not done, then it will impact on our ability to ensure you get paid for your streaming royalties. Okay, keeping your account up to date, obviously important. This is personal details. Um, it's basically bank account, um, address, phone contact details, etc., email. If that changes, go in here and, and inform us of it. But there is also in here the ability to inform us of pseudonyms or write other names that you write under. Um, if you click on the pseudonym box, it will bring up this slide. Firstly, it will tell you the different names that are registered on your account that re relate to you, but it also enable you to add a pseudonym by clicking on the blue button. Um, again, this impacts on our ability to identify your work, so it's important you do that if you write or are known under another name. Okay, so let's assume that that's all up and running. You're gigging. Make sure you inform us of every single show, regardless of how large or small it is, we need to be aware of it. If you don't tell us, then potentially you won't get paid for it. You go onto the Report Live Performances page, and there's the button for reporting your live performances. It's a straightforward process. You tell us the date of the performance, where the performance took place, um, who performed the performance, and the bit that's most important, what songs were performed. You can adjust the durations to 
fit the live show. So therefore, if you've got a, a three minute song and you chose to completely wig out and do a 10 minute version of it, then you can tell us about that. Um, but you need to adapt it and change it in this, in this part of the thing. Um, the other thing to say on uh, performances is that with regard the venues that you play at, if you're, for those smaller venues, if you don't tell us, then you definitely won't get paid. For some of the larger venues, then we can use the information that has been submitted to us via the venue, if the venue provides it. But for clubs, for cafes, for pubs, etc., if you don't tell us, then you won't get paid. Um, also, you can inform us about any show you do. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, it can be an open mic. So if any of you do open mic nights, Every open mic session that you do, you can tell us about it. It doesn't matter whether it's free and it doesn't matter if there's 100 people in the room or one person and a dog. The important thing is that you tell us about it. You'll, the more you tell us about it, the more you're likely to get paid. Okay, so talking of getting paid, let's just very quickly give you an idea as to the sort of values. These values can change or do change. PRS pays out four times a year, um, dependent obviously on your music being used. So for Radio 1, taking it as an example, you'll see you've got three peak uh, statuses. You've got high, low and non. That's basically based around the time of the day that the broadcast took place. The high peak is the breakfast show when, for radio, that's when most people are going to be listening. The non-peak is during the late o'clock at night, um, during the early hours of, of the morning. Um, so it, it changes. I've listed up there a per minute value. So therefore, for a three minute song played on the breakfast show on Radio 1 is going to generate in the region of 45 quid. Um, but that's the total royalty. Then that will be split dependent on the share splits on that song registration. So again, that's where it becomes important. We pay out based on the information that we're told about. Um, all of these, every broadcaster, for radio and for TV, we use this high, low and non-peak process. Um, I've just shown you, demonstrated the Radio 1 ones there. Um, local radio does pay, but it's minimal in comparison to national radio. Um, okay, and for TV, the values go up because there's going to be more people watching and the peak periods differ. So therefore, the high peak for TV is not the breakfast show. It's um, during the from six o'clock to 11 o'clock in the evening. OK, live. So I mentioned earlier about the small shows. Um, the value for playing one of those small shows is approximately £10 a show. Again, that is split dependent on the set list that we receive. So if we only receive one set list, let's say that you played in a, uh, I don't know, in a cafe, and three, there was three acts that played, and only one of those acts is a member, or only maybe all three are members, but only one of them surprised us with a set list, then we'll, we, will be pay, we will allocate that money totally to the person who provides us with the information. So it's important, you know, basically, tell us you're playing those small shows and there's a potential for you receiving that money. Um, there is one thing to note about the small shows is that you have only have 12 months to inform us. So um, if you don't get your, your, the t from the performance date, so you need to get that in sort of sh sharpish. For the other venues, the, the major concert venues, the way in which we allocate the royalty is very different. It's based on the box office takings. So therefore, that's obviously dependent on the price on the, of the ticket and, it's, and how many people actually purchase the ticket. So you could be playing, the, I don't know, the, the O2 Arena in, in, Lon in London, 20,000 capacity or thereabouts. Um, you charge £100 a show, but only one person pays it. Then therefore, you've only, you've only got, or we only get 4.2% of that 100%. Or hundred pound. So therefore, it's important that um, it it varies. It's dependent on how successful the show is and what the ticket prices are. Um, we receive the four point two percent, and then it's that is then further allocated uh, amongst the songs that the headline played, and the songs that all the support acts played. So again, what's crucial for us though is to get that data in, so as we know how to allocate that money that we receive. 
Um, okay, so and receiving payment, you'll get a royalty statement. Our royalty statements are all online. You can analyze them, you can view them, you can download them. You, if you download them, you can put them into CSV, you can play around with them, etc. Um, what I would say though is that when you view them, you'll be faced with um, information like that. It will list the, the top five key tracks, but everything is there at the bottom. It says all work paid, so therefore you can see everything. Um, and top right of rings is an analytics tool. If you click on there, so you can further sort of drill into the information. Um, it's really good information. It enables you to see which of your songs are most successful. And for any of you who are hitting or receiving royalties overseas, it enables you to see which territories are playing your music. Um, okay, and that basically is it. So apologies for going over time. Um, thanks for listening. We're not going to do any questions now. We're going to go straight into John. So quickly, I just want to say as well, PRS, they are really good as well. So you can ring them up and they'll talk you through stuff. So you'll see that we advertise that we had Mel coming from um, PPL. Unfortunately, she's not very well. So we've got John who's going to cover for her. She, he works here and his work there. So he's got a wealth of knowledge still. So thanks for stepping in, John. So yeah, thanks again, Stuart. And now over to you, John. Hi, uh, yeah, so I'm John Hutchinson. As uh, you mentioned there, I worked here for four years. Um, I was a licensing business partner, and six months ago I moved across to PPL, and now I'm the uh, senior licensing business development executive, which is way too big a title for a young lad. So we've got, I know um, Stuart Carly gave you a bit of background into uh, PPL as well, so we'll just go through that. Um, so yeah, an introduction to PPL, and basically, yeah, get played and get paid, if you remember. I'm going to look at uh, what we actually do, the difference between, oops, the difference between us and uh, PRS, which we've already sort of touched on, the market, who we license, um, international collections, which is increasingly important, um, revenues and distributions, and managing your data, as Stuart touched on with PRS, it's slightly different with PPL. Um, and then a quick recap, and then uh, I think we're going to do something else. But yeah, panel. Good, good. It's all under control. So we, yeah, we were, we were established, what's that, 76, 97 years, 99 years ago. Am I right? Um, no, 89, thank you. Um, yeah, so we, we were there to help ensure those who you know, invest their time and talent and money and everything should get paid. For their work, um, we have about 130,000 performers uh, as members, which is pretty impressive. Uh, we license the recorded music. Uh, here is, as Alex mentioned earlier, Leicester is concerned with the public performance, and that's pretty much where I sit in with PPL. So I deal with tariff development and things like that. Um, the fees, then, same as PRS, they're collected. The administration costs are taken out and then the rest is distributed to members. We're a not-for-profit company, same as all three. Uh, we've got a network of about 100, and it's increasing all the time, of international agreements. So you can collect your money pretty much wherever in the world your track's played, which is, is increasingly important. Uh, yeah, and then 2021, £252 million pounds we collected on behalf of members, which is pretty good. So anyone who's performed on recorded music can join as a member. That's whether you just played trombone as a backing track or whatever. You know, if it, you, you just work out the rights in the same way as PRS. So uh, recording rights holders can be anything major record labels and minor record labels. And much more now we're seeing self-release. I, I guess some of you guys do that. You just record your own stuff and stick it out. It's so simple now, isn't it? Whereas before you needed pretty much a record company to get the distribution. Distribution is a lot easier now. Um, if you're a performer who also owns the rights, then you need to register as both a performer and an artist. Sorry, a performer and a recording rights holder. So we've got two elements, recording and uh, performer. So in a similar way to PRS, you need to make sure you're, you're registered as, as both. 
So the difference between us and PRS, uh, let's say Stuart looked at this, we represent the recording rights holders and performers, so the people that actually play the music, uh, play and record the music, whereas PRS is the people who created the music. Uh, we license recorded music for broadcast, we do TV, radio, and certain digital media services. You'll, it's not always easy, um, Spotify's one, where they have their own agreement with, um, with rights holders and record companies. But generally speaking, we, we, um, we deal with all the broadcast rights for like BBC, ITV, Channel 4, and local radio, independent radio, online radio, which is again is becoming a, a, you know, a much bigger thing. We licensed, yeah, see there, 250 plus broadcast channels, which is, which is pretty amazing because you don't necessarily realize how many there are out there. Um, I'm part of the team at PPL, although it's not my role, I'm part of the same team as broadcast and I know how hard those guys work. Um, if you've ever negotiated with the BBC, it's, uh, it's, it's a long old haul. <laughs> um, 410 over-the-air radio stations and 1,800 online radio stations. That's why it's important to join as a PPL member because you're never going to know if your song's been played on any one of those. Because, you know, if it plays on BBC Radio 1, you're, you're all in there. You know, you pop it on Facebook. You're never going to know with these guys. So if you're registered, we'll know because they're going to send us their playlist. Uh, we've got uh, about 400,000 businesses and organisations, uh, bars, nightclubs, offices, shops, all that sort of thing. So all of that background music that you hear when you're wandering around with your trolley around Tesco, you can earn money out of that. It's a bit like a club card, but you created your own club card sort of thing. Uh, Alex covered this as well. Um, 2018, yeah. Uh, PPL and PRS had talked for a long time about sort of joining forces to license public performance. Uh, there was a lot of people who played PPL, a lot of people who played PRS, some played, paid both. By joining forces, we could make sure that the members' revenue was maximised because if we know a shop's got PPL, we can just add PRS because they should have both. We, very, we work very closely with PRS for Music. I had a meeting with, uh, with PRS this afternoon. Uh, we, we talk to each other all the time. There's certain things we can talk about and some certain things we can't talk about uh, because we are two separate organisations. I think that's important to remember. International collections. Like I said, this is really important and becoming more important now because music is, is worldwide. It's international now. We have uh, 100, over 100 agreements with, uh, we're, we're known as collective management organizations, CMOs, that's, that's what they're called. We have other CMOs all around the world. When your music is played in Brazil, there's, a, there's an organization in Brazil, similar to ourselves and PRS, that collect the royalties. Those royalties, if it's British-based music, is then sent back to PRS and PPL, and we will distribute it. They'll tell us what songs have been played, Here's the money, and we can distribute it to you. So we've got 100 of those. It changes all the time, because more and more countries are getting uh, right, uh, CMOs uh, you know, established. Uh, the Middle East is one, which up until about two years ago was a bit sporadic, but now ESMA have come along, which is a set, you know, similar to PPL and PRS, and they're doing the job. They're, they're picking up money from the Middle East now and sending it back to Britain. We, uh, we brought in 94 million pounds doing that last year, which is pretty impressive when you think that that's a growing market and it is growing quite, at quite a pace. Uh, we, we collect more international rights money than any other organization, recording organization, which we're very proud of. We have an agreement with every country in the EU. Um, the EU's very... Um, very similar. Uh, we, we pretty much all work on the same basis and the same to the same rules. So it was very, very, very easy to set up agreements with the EU. Um, yeah, we got, yeah, there's another one there for uh, Indonesia, which we signed two years ago. So ESMA was signed, I think, about 18 months ago. So you can see that's it keeps developing. We get more and more, and it means more money for you guys. 
So these are some of the countries that we currently have agreements with. So you can see we're pretty much there. We've got a few gaps to fill in, but it's, it's happening. Not all these countries have got, um, you know, collective management organisations, so we can't sort of have an agreement with them because we can't negotiate with them. Um, China being one. So uh, international revenue, and you can see how important and how much it's, it's coming along. You know, just five, six years ago, it's doubled, which is incredible. And that's like another 49 million pounds for you guys that you didn't have before. When it comes to, you know, where that money comes from, Germany, strangely, is top of the list. Bigger than America for British music, which is not something you'd necessarily, uh, necessarily know. Um, then, yeah, USA, France, Netherlands, all that sort of thing. So you can see it's very, it is very European, um, America sort of led. Um, the revenue on internationals. But as music spreads, then, you know, you're going to see more revenue coming in from like asthma in the Middle East and, you know, all those sort of guys. Revenues and distributions. Um, you can see, we as I said earlier, it was 252 million in 2021. You can see the effect of the pandemic and how, you know, the recording money went down. I think we possibly suffered a little less than PRS because obviously we don't license live and live was just knocked on the head wasn't it for like 18 months whereas radio stations tv stations were still pouring out music so we were a little bit protected from that so uh where the money comes from so we're taking 72 million pounds in public performance and dubbing so that's most of the guys here um dubbing is uh when they're copying music from one format to another. So if you start up a streaming, so let's say music on hold is a great example. So you, you want to set up a music on hold company and offer it to factories and offices. So you copy a track onto your system so that you can offer it. That's a copy. You need paying for it because that's copying as Stuart pointed out earlier. It's one of the restricted acts. Um, we've got 86.7 million pound in broadcast revenue. So that's all the TV, radio, streaming, that sort of thing. And then that 94 million pounds in international revenue. So I think the nice thing is there's a good spread there and it's a fairly even spread coming in from around the world, uh, from, from, from every sector. Distributions. Uh, I mean, we paid 146,000 performers in 2021. Uh, PRS mentioned they make two payments a year, we make four. You don't get any more money for that. We're not double paying. Um, it's split record, uh, on a specific court recording in a similar way to PRS. Uh, you can split it, you can be 50-50, you can be 25%. If there's four, you could be 50% and five, 10 percent How you do it is up to you. So performer allocations featured and non-featured. Uh, obviously featured, we'd, we'd quick mention about the difference from this from a sort of our point of view about the difference between featured music and, and non-featured music. Non-featured music is music that's not um, essential for the event or the business. So if you go into a shop, you go into Tesco's, other shops are available, and they've got recorded music playing, then that's non-featured. Because if you turn the music off, you can still shop. If you run a DJ, if you run a nightclub, and you turn the music off, I think you wouldn't have much of a nightclub. So that's featured. The nightclub, the music is a feature of that premises. That's the difference that we, we talk about. So how do you manage your data? We've got a similar sort of online system. Uh, so my PPL is your sort of portal. You'll have your own portal. You'll have your own password. It's password secure. So you can then go in, you can search the repertoire, you can view what payments you've uh, been, uh, you, what payments you've made, you can register repertoire. My advice would be, and I think Stuart would also agree, register your works, all of them. And the reason I'm saying that is A, it means that you get paid for them. When you sign up with PPL or PRS, you are 
handing over basically your licensing, your rights to public performance to PPL and PRS, and that's what they're going to sort of enforce on your behalf. So when you get a um, when you register a record, a recording, it's much easier for us to track that track has been played there because we're getting lists from TV, radio, we're getting lists from jukebox suppliers. So all the jukebox suppliers we license directly, they give us their playlist. So if your song's played in the pub, we're probably gonna know about it. So if you've registered that song, it's much easier for us to pick up. We will pick it up anyway, because you've handed over the license to all the rights to public performance to us. So if Harry Giorgio has a song on there and he's not registered it, we know that Harry Giorgio is a member. We control the copyright on all of his songs for public performance, so we can sort of pick it up. But it makes it a little difficult. And for the guys here at Leicester, um, they are often asked. Uh, an art gallery would be a great example. So that your music's going to play on a loop in an art gallery as some back into you know, a, a, a particular exhibition. Not great for the staff who are just gonna listen to this thing on a loop and go crazy. But what it means is, if you're the, 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 guy, the guy who runs the exhibition is probably gonna phone it into here and say, is this song repertoire? And our guys will do a rep repertoire check. And if you've not registered it, it's not gonna come up. And then we have to go probably back to you and say, is this song, so you're gonna get delayed payments, you've got to just register everything, all of it. So, uh, yeah, you can view your payments, statements, contact details, you can update your bank, if you change your bank, you can update your bank details. Uh, new recordings, releases, manage your repertoire, uh, and make claims on your existing repertoire. Joining, joining, simple. Um, yeah, just you just join and you get a you get a login detail and that's it. Off you go. It's, it's that simple. So, quick recap: um, make sure your name's right when you register. We have had that, and then they phone us up and say, "Why haven't you had? Oh, why, I've been on Radio One. Why haven't I had any money?" You know, it's like, well, you've spelt your name wrong. You know, we we couldn't pick it up. Um, Register for international collections. You've already seen, I've shown you. There's a lot of money in internationals. Register for it. Uh, keep the account details up to date. If you move, if you, you know, change your email, whatever, just keep, keep it up to date. Manage the repertoire. That is important, like I've just said. Make sure you license all your songs. Register all your songs. Um, and there's a lot of other stuff on the PPL. Has anybody been on the PPL website? Yeah. There's a lot of other information on there, not just about membership. There's details about dubbing, about um, you know performing, and there's a load of resources on there. So check it out. So contact details, I'll leave that up there. Um, if you want to become a member, if you're not already a member, then you'd be very welcome. You can see the benefits of it. And that's me done. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Um, you can stay up here. So now we're going to do the quick panel. We're going to be really quick. So if I can get Harry Giorgio and Manis Calder up as well, I'll get a seat for you all. Just change that back to the main slide. So Harry's just nipped toilet. I'm going to go when he comes back. Um, so yeah, so we'll start with you, Manis, because obviously we've had an introduction from these guys. So what I wanted to do is get a producer and an artist up as well. Just give like again a, a little different overview of you know kind of what's important. Uh, what I will say though before I forget as well is like um, I heard you saying before, Stuart, about you know getting splits and agree in terms and I know generally musicians and producers are super creative and no one wants to talk about splits and business you know so every time someone gives me a song I'm like what's the splits like oh, we've not spoke about it you know so I think agreeing it is one thing but really you need it also 
you need it in writing or you need it at least in an email, you know, because it's never going to hit the fan until something goes big. And then all of a sudden, everyone might get greedy because, oh, well, there's loads of money there now. I'm not happy with my 2% that we agreed on the day. So try and get your agreements down. And this is like the bane of my life, like trying to, where is it? Where's the song split? So make sure you get them down. But we'll start with you, Manish. Do you want to give yourself, give an overview, introduce yourself, tell them who you are, and maybe say like your, I suppose, why PPL and PRS might be important to you? Um, hello, everybody. My name is Manish, Manish Kulo. Nice to see everyone turn out today. Um, I'm an engineer, music producer, um, studio manager, graphic designer sometimes. Um, I've been in teaching, do one-to-one -one kind of mentoring as well for music. I'm also a facilitator at HU Recording. And yeah, I pretty much do everything apart from rap and sing. So a very heavily musically um, influenced and based. Um, to do with PPL and PRS, I mean like PRS never really came to an importance in my life. I signed up for it a long time ago, but then I started to realize I was making, getting bigger clients, working with bigger people, um, earning obviously more money and closing more deals. So the importance is going back to obviously understanding, understanding the publishing rights and the mastering rights to your song. Because a lot of people seem to understand that, you know, the song itself, the actual physical format of the song, what you upload to the distributor is one thing, but the elements within the song, for example, I make a song with Harry in the studio today. Um, I made the beat, he made the lyrics. And the important part is really at the beginning is to squash out who owns what as well and the percentages. Because later down the line, when working with people who are not, let's say, who don't have PRS, maybe later down the line, it might bite them back or they might come up and say, oh, well, I didn't agree to that 20% because I did this, this and that and you did this. So it is really important kind of squashing that stuff out at the beginning because obviously you can take a very big dull on creativity. So, you know, Vanadium here, he's one of my, he's a fellow producer of mine that's in the city, has his own studio. So when making a song with someone, obviously you understand that you made the beat, you supplied the time, you supplied the mix, you supplied the master. Generally, in that setting, apart from the lyrics, you pretty much own majority of that song. But it's kind of hard to explain to someone because someone will be like, oh, well, I, I, sp I spat my bars on this, so I own the whole thing, which isn't exactly what it is. So that's really important. And um, yeah, when coming to like publishing as well, knowing the differences, for example, I had a song that was placed on um, 2K21. Um, the song was called Shanghai by an artist called Kamikaze and myself. And the song was just two friends who made a song and we put it out, we didn't think anything of it. And then a year later, um, I think a woman called Victoria from Fox Sound Studios emailed me during um, the lockdown saying, oh, who owns this song? We want to um, basically put it in a game. And the reason why they reached out to me and not to Kamikaze is because I was the rights holder and the master owner of the song where, because it was put out on my own record label where Kamikaze really, the only thing he really owned on the song was the lyrics. And Luckily, we're both friends, so when he, he gave me a call the next day, I knew he was sweating, I could hear it in his voice. Hey, bro, do you remember that song we made? Oh, uh, yeah, 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 that one. Oh, it's, I heard it's going to be in a game. I said, yeah, well, it's going to be a 50-50 split down the middle, like we agreed. But if I was someone who wasn't his friend, or maybe I was a hired musician or a producer, or he gave me that song then to put out, I could easily turn around and negotiate my master rights or publishing rights with him. But luckily, he's one of my good friends, so... We managed to sort that out quite fast. There wasn't no stress. Um, yeah, so the importance of PPL as well, I've just signed up for it lately, like in the last six months, which on my behalf is quite poor because I didn't understand how important it was. and I didn't understand there was more ways to collect my money through obviously performances and obviously streams and, and all sorts. So I think it's really important that you have PRS and PPL from the beginning of your career. As soon as you have a song that's been put onto distribution, you can put it on. And I'm pretty sure you can apply songs to PRS before they're out as well? Most definitely. Yeah, Most definitely. <laughs> uh, yeah I am excellent. So we'll be, I am always being asked by people, when's the right time to register with us? Do we wait until we release it? And the answer is no. As soon as the, the song is in some form, you know, you basically agreed those share splits or it's at a finished state, get it registered. You know, because the intention may be to get it a recording released, but who knows, you could sort of be invited into, I don't know, do a radio broadcast, etc. They There might be a sort of a, a pre-release that's played or anything. So therefore, just get them registered as soon as possible. 
One other thing to say is that as far as membership goes, we don't retrospectively, for any of you that aren't members, there isn't a sort of a retrospective period. Well, more to the point, there is a slight one. So therefore, at this point in time, if for those of you that aren't members, if you're considering joining, if you were to join now, your membership would cover you from the 1st of January of this year. And it will remain the 1st of January until the last day of June. So you've got a small window of opportunity should you should should you should you off that doesn't make sense but you know if you if you're considering joining get it in before the end of june once we get into july that clock resets and then the start date becomes the first of july so anything you've done this year up to this point would have been missed so really you need to sort of consider that now okay cool so yeah that's manis caller a uh, producer at hq um Quickly as well, you know, he's talking about masters and publishing and stuff like that. So I don't know if everyone knows, but basically the master rights is who owns the recording. So a lot of the time people talk, there's a lot of talk about who owns the master. A lot of the time it's who pays for who pays for it. So if you want to own your master, you need to be paying for your recordings, making sure you own it. If you put it out for a label, you might be licensing them the master. And with publishing, it's really important to have everything ready to go as well. Because if someone contacts you today and they're like, yeah, we want to put this in a game, they want to know within maybe that same day or the next day who owns it, who is it, who's the rights, who, who are the splits going to. So just be aware of that because there's a lot of talk about masters. So if you want to own them, that's cool, but you got to you got to pay for them. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so uh, what was said is 100% correct. If you pay for your session, then you should own the rights. But if you do it at home, you know, you're a sort of bedroom producer, et cetera, if you own the equipment, then the same applies. Yeah, so, you know, it doesn't have to be that you've gone down to a studio and actually paid for a session. Um, you could have done it on your own, as long as it's your equipment. So if a mate says, yeah, you can use all my kit, um, actually, that's fine. But unless you've got something in writing, they will end up owning the rights in that. In that. Thanks. So, yeah, next up, we've got Harry. So, Harry, you want to introduce yourself? Tell them a little bit about your experience with PPL and PRS, how you've earned money, etc. Sure. So my name's Harry Giorgio. I'm an artist, producer, live performer. I also work with Yasin and the team at HQ Recording Studio. Um, yeah, so I've been releasing music, I guess, seriously for about 10 years. And um, to be honest, everything we've covered today, I'll be totally honest, like I've slapped on until recently. So it's something that I would, I'd say, get on straight away. Um, in regards to, so uh, three years ago, I actually signed a publishing deal. I won't say who it was and stuff, but um, there was a lot of things that weren't explained to me when I signed this publishing deal. And as mentioned before, when you sign a publishing de deal, they're supposed to take care of all this stuff. Um, and I kind of wasn't aware. Um, things weren't communicated as well as they could be. And um, just recently, I found out I'd missed out on about four years' worth of royalties. Um, so in the last three or four years, I've played the O2 Academy. I've been doing a bunch of shows in London. Um, I've been, like, played on Radio 1, um, done a lot of stuff with BBC Introducing. And because I hadn't got on, to on top of my stuff, basically, um, I missed out on these royalties. Um, so advice for you guys would be get on this stuff straight away. Um, you don't even need to have recorded a song yet. If you write songs, if you're under 25, you can literally just sign up for 30 quid. Um, and as soon as you've written the song, just register it, just register stuff, stay on top of it, and the money will find its way back to you. So, Yeah, yeah I think that's a good point. You know, like, And again, like I say, we're, we're a small label, we're a small, you know, we're, we're kind of emer emerging, you know. So a lot of people at the top, they've got people who do all this stuff for them, but... You know, it's it's easy to think, oh, I've got a publisher, it's all sorted now. But, you know, even if you have, you still got to check this stuff is being done, you know, so. Yeah, you've got to stay on top of stuff, you know, like making sure you're educated and just be able to log into PRS or PPL and just check that things are being done properly. And on, on a better note, I have just re-signed with a new publisher and things are looking good, but as I say, yeah. Okay, so I've got one or two questions, and then I'm going to come out, and if you guys have got questions, we're going to give you guys a chance to ask a few questions, and we're going to do some networking. Um, so I think my first question will be maybe for all of you, because I, I was on the radio today talking about AI and music, 
And this is the big thing at the minute. And obviously royalties and copyrights and also, I suppose, the, the, the potential of um, Web3 and blockchain. Like, do you guys think, if we start from John and work down, do you think that this might have like an impact on royalties and copyrights and that kind of stuff? And yeah, do you think it's going to change the way things are working? Yes, is a quick answer. Um, there, it isn't really legally settled yet because who owns the copyright to a song that an AI program has produced? Is it the programmer? Is it the person who owns the program? Or is it, if they're sort of using samples and things like that, is it the, the sampler, the, the, the owner of the sample? Uh, the main sort of crux is who owns that, who owns that recording? Um, so you may use AI and produce a very clever recording that, that goes and sells a lot. Right now, we don't really know whether you're gonna own the rights to that because you created it using the program, but the guy on the program is gonna say, well, hang on, this is my program. You've just used it, same as you use a keyboard. So I want that money. So I think, you know, watch this space and, and see how it pans out. But um, yeah, it's gonna change things, definitely. I ain't really got much more to add to that. I mean, that really sort of articulated it. I mean, it is, there's a lot of discussion about it as far as copyright goes, as far as who's actually created it. You know, there has to be someone behind it. I suppose the other party, ultimately, with any new technology, there's going to be people saying, well, we own it or they own it or because it's about money. Um, I suppose the other party that um, John didn't mention is also the employers, you know, the businesses, because the businesses will also, um, rightly so, have a... a a right to say, well, actually, we own it because we employed so and so to do that piece of work. Um, so it is a case of watching this space. There is a lot of discussion about it. Um, who knows what's around the corner there? Everything changes. Just, just to add to that, um, there are obviously different, there's like chat, GTP, is it? And, and there's other sort of AI programs around. Um, for once in your life, read the terms and conditions because <laughs> it's probably in there somewhere. So just on a different spin then, Harry, like, as an artist, you know, like, obviously so far you, you you write all your own songs. Sometimes you write, obviously co-write with Matt and stuff like that. Like, would you be, I don't know, would you be like, looking to work with AI to help write songs and collaborate? No. <laughs> Matt's no. worried he's going to be out of a job here. I bet it's going to learn to right. play guitar. But I believe everything is a tool, like everything in history, when like drum machines were first made, people were saying, oh, we need real drummers. And I just feel like that's always, we're not gonna go back in time. Things are gonna keep getting more advanced. So I feel like as long as you use, use it as a tool, I believe it can be a good thing. Um, and it may even create more value for things that have been done by humans, if that makes sense. So I believe use it as a tool. Like if there's any rappers in here, how many of you have used like the rhyming dictionary before? I thought no one then, I was going to say, just me then. But um, you know what I mean? They're, they're just tools at the end of the day. And I've seen now you can even get it to like write your artist bio and stuff like that. Um, and some people hate doing stuff like that. So I believe use it as a tool, as I say. Yeah, going back to what Harry says, use it as a tool. So when that first Lenza app came out a couple of months back and we had like different renditions and pictures, I had a few graphic designers messaging me saying, oh, I'm, I'm really against this because it's losing out on my job and it's taking kind of what I do away from, you know, I can get 200 pictures of myself as a cartoon for 10 quid where my graphic designer can give me one for 80 quid. So I can understand how it can affect a market as well. But I also spoke to that graphic designer. I said, why don't you work with it? Why don't you implement designs like this into your work? So instead of working against AI or being really against it, like Harry said, work with it. I mean, it would be really helpful if all of my vocalists weren't available for a session and I needed an eight bar hook song, I could just put it into AI and put it on my song. Um, I don't see anything against it, but I do disagree with the whole point of human feel and touch because end of the day, you might want things in a specific way in your music where you know a robot's doing it for you or you know, AI is doing it for you and it's not really having that same feel that you'd get. But I'm not gonna lie, some of these AI covers are pretty hard, you know, I'm not gonna lie, like it has some, but you know. Oh, he had an Eminem, David Guetta yeah, had an Eminem yeah, verse. In his DJ set and it wasn't even real. Oh, for real? Yeah, man. So yeah, so I don't know, I'm, I'm learning, I'm 
not totally with it, but I'm not totally against it either. Like going back to chat G PT and like helping you with like write emails and bios and stuff. There is beneficial ways, but you know, I don't want to lose my job basically. <laughs> I think that's it. Everyone, no one wants to lose a job and everyone wants to earn money, which is why it's important to know about the different ways you can get it. Like how, how did it feel first time? I suppose you, you got a PR, your PRS payment day and you've actually got something in there, no matter how big or how small was that? I spent it straight away. Um, felt like a bit of a rock star when it came in. Um, the, probably the biggest PRS payment I probably received was when I did the Pepsi Max advert and I didn't really understand that. I got basically... When a publisher hits you up, so Harry, like he said, he was with the publisher and, and obviously he, he let them go and signed up to obviously a new publisher, right? So I'm, I'm represented by a publisher as well, which obviously it is very useful. They collect your like royalties and stuff for you. But um, going back to that is um, knowing basically that when they do buy your music, they will buy it for two rights. They'll buy the master rights from you and they'll buy the publishing rights from you as well. So in a sense that you kind of lose your art in a sense because you're licensing it away and giving it to someone else. So you don't have that total control that you thought you once had. But it's the way of business and music, so. Okay, cool. And um, Harry, so, you know, like you, like you say, you perform, you've been performing, you, you know you've lost out on certain things. So do you think like going forward, is it, you know, like a big thing for you to be making sure that your things are being logged correctly and maybe checking with venues and stuff like that about PRS and... Sure. A hundred percent. I think the longer you leave it, the more of a task it becomes, if that makes sense. So even if you haven't done one gig yet, but you're playing open mics, you can literally log those gigs and you will get paid for them, even if the song isn't recorded. So as long as you stay on top of what you're doing, after every gig, you can just log it. As soon as you've written a song, just log it. Just stay on top of it and it's a much smaller job. So, yeah. Okay, cool. So we're going to have one more question. Manish got a question for you too. And then I'm um, going to come out. Yeah, just going back to live performance in the gigs, because I know we've got some f few DJs in here that are producers. So if I'm DJing at a gig that is PPL, PRL licensed, and I'm playing my own song, but I'm not performing it, do I can I still claim on that? Yeah? So if I was just, just to play the master out into the PA, so I'm playing my master recording out, do I then claim back on that song? Is that how it works? Okay, cool. It's a live performance what you're doing. You know, the, the, you're using technology to produce, but ultimately you're playing a live show. So it, it comes back to that whole thing about telling us about it, because we're only as good as the information that we receive. So you know, getting everything registered on both databases and then telling us of the usages. You know, for some it's not necessary. For bulk radio, for example, it shouldn't be necessary because we get that data in. But for live, it's very different. I think one thing, the difference, obviously, that I've mentioned before is that we don't license live music, live performances. In that case, it would not be a live performance because you're using recorded music. So you would still be able to, to, to sort of collect royalties on that performance because it's not live. So does that mean then that the DJs have to put their own stuff? If they are the creators of the music, uh, the, rec the, the recorders of the music, yes. I have a... St oh. <laughs> so if you're a DJ again um, and you play five tracks of your own music and then ten tracks of other people's music do you only get paid for those five tracks or do you get paid for the performance from PRS for instance and then each five tracks each of those five tracks from PPL it's different distribution is, is one thing we're asked about a lot um, and it's immensely complicated. Um, it's full of legal stuff and everything else because we have to comply with, with um, both EU regulations and um, the Copyright Science Patent Act. Um, uh, just to give you an example of how comp complex it is, both because we have to be um, open about what we do, both the distribution rules for PRS and PPL are both on our respective websites. If you want to read PRSs, it's 168 pages long, and ours is 182 pages long. So if you fancy some bedtime reading, then you can just end up. Um, obviously, it's difficult in that situation where you've got a performance where you can, um, you're can you using recorded music because there is no live element, so you won't be recording, re reporting to PRS of a, as a live performance. Um, 
the difficulty from sort of our point of view is that we don't distribute necessarily based on a performance, unlike PRS where you've got that live element. You can play in a pub, you've got a set list, everything else. It's a little bit more difficult for us because we deal with just the recording. Um, so it would be in sort of general distribution. Okay, so if I'm DJing then, I don't actually, I'm not gonna be. Can I, I just well. sort of give you the PRS side of things. Um, so when you're doing a live show, because if you're, if you're DJing and it's, you know, you're perf making, doing a live performance, then you can claim for that as a live show. You know, if it's under, if it's under your name, you know, you're the artist that's performing, and you, and then when you provide us with the set list, you can provide. So we call it, you know, it's not just for a sort of a traditional bands plugging their guitars in. You know, if you're up there doing a doing a DJ performing a live show, then you there is a PRS royalty that you're entitled to, but we need that set list. When you submit that set list. Back to your example, if you say you've got five of your songs and 15 are others, then we would ask for you to provide us with the full 20 songs and not just your own. So therefore that will ensure whatever royalty is generated from the tickets that are sold for, the, for your gig, we can then allocate it out among all of the songwriters. So if you include one of my songs, God forbid, um, then you get, I'd get some money for it. Is that? Yeah. I think also just just to, just to quickly add to that, um, there is a method, although we don't have that, that method of uploading a, a sort of set list. I say we don't, we don't license live, so we don't have that. Um, there is an email address where you can um, send us the email, an email with the tracks that you've played, where they were played, everything else, and we can take that into account when we do distribution. So there is a sort of method of doing it, but it's a bit old school. One last thing to say for a lot of the, I mean, we're obviously technology is important. We're using a lot of MR, uh, music recognition technology to sort of give us that information. It's, you know, it's still at sort of early stages because we we need the clubs, the big clubs to sign into that. No, but those that do, then therefore that's obviously going to aid. And hopefully going forward, we'll have that in live as well. So. And just just on from that, you know, like is say like if Zach's DJ and he plays three tracks of his own, and the next set he plays twenty tracks, does the royalty fluctuate depending on how many of your own songs? Yeah. Uh, there's so an art, there's a question, yes, uh, Jackie. Cheers. Hi, Stuart, and hi, everybody. And I'd just like to say thank you for today and what you've organised, because I think it's fantastic. Um, I've worked in the music industry for a long time, and what they're saying, you need to really take note of, OK? It's really, really important. But one of the things I have learned today is that PRS's membership has changed since March for 30 quid if you're under 25. So I'd just like a bit of clarity, looking around the room here, there's some, perhaps some young people, um, can you clarify, is that £30 lifetime membership, or do they then pay when they're 26 the £100 lifetime membership, Good please? question, good question. Right, so regard, of course, re regardless, so depending on your age, de determines how much you pay, but once you've made that payment, so if you're under 25, you pay 30 quid, that's it, it's lifetime membership, you don't have to pay, you know, when you get to 26, we don't come knocking at the door again and say, right, give us 100 quid. If sadly you're someone like me and a little bit older, than one, well, maybe I'm, yeah, a little bit older than 25, yeah, um, <laughs> then I would have to pay 100 quid. But again, the same principle applies. It's a one-off fee. All of them, are, and one last thing to add on it, the admission fees for at PRS is to offset the administration it takes to process the applications. You know, we try to operate as best as possible on a not-for-profit basis, but there is there are costs. So rather than that, those costs be spread amongst our members, that's why anyone looking to join has to have that initial payment. But Jackie, the answer is, it's if you're under 25, it's 30 quid and that's it, there's no further payment. Hi, um, so I had a question about MCPS. So you meant, this is a three part question. So it's a, so you, you mentioned earlier about um, if you had a publisher, then you wouldn't require I think you said an MP, uh, MCPS license. 
Um, so I'm with a publisher now. So that means, does that mean I won't have to register with MCPS? And then in addition to that, it's also, I have a distributor who also is um, claiming that they have got real royalties for me. And so I'm just a bit confused that to how that works. And is that related to streaming as well? Not just like CD sales and vinyl. Okay, let's see. <laughs> Um, okay, so firstly, as far as the publishing side of things go and MCPS membership. So MCPS is owned by the Music Publishers Association. The way that MCPS operates is very different to the way that, w that PRS operates. Um, but the, so any royalty that is generated from the mechanical right is paid out to whoever owns the rights in that. So if you signed a deal with a publisher for the track in question, then the publisher will receive the entire set of royalties. I mean, there's lots of different publishing deals that you can do. You can do it on a specific, so it could be on a song by song basis. It can be exclusive that covers everything you've written now and everything you will do, etc. So if you've got an exclusive deal that covers your entire repertoire, what is and what will be, therefore, it's not necessary for you to join MCPS because your royalties will be collected via your publisher and they will then account to you. So if there's obviously if there's been an advance, etc., then they will take that into consideration as to what you receive back. But the important thing is that they should be accounting to you. Okay. Now with regard to streaming, um, there's different sets of if you like there's if you look if you imagine there's a streaming pie and or a circular thing, and therefore that is cut out or allocate the royalty generated for streaming revenue is allocated out. So therefore, firstly, so if you imagine you've got 100% whole, 30% or thereabouts of that, immediately any generated money, well, 30% of that generated money goes to the actual platform itself, so Spotify or whoever. Then uh, the lion's share, which is around about 55 to 60%, is paid to the distributor that, or your aggregator that basically is dealing with, but what they're doing is that, that royalties in regard to the um, master rights or the, or the um, recording rights, and this is the element that PPL doesn't you know, um, uh, license. And then the remainder, which is around about 15, 20%, so the smallest part of it goes to the songwriter or the creator. And that 15, 20% is split 50, 50 between the performing right and the mechanical right, right? So therefore, if there's 100 quid, uh, of that 100 quid, let's say 20 quid of it goes to the, is in regard to the songwriting, that 20 quid is then split 50, 50 between the performing and the mechanical. So if you're a PRS member, you'll get your 10 pound via PRS. And if you've got a publishing deal, the other 10 pound will get to you via, um, the, or could potentially get to you via the um, publisher. And how would that go through? Would that have come through the publisher? And is that the neighboring rights? So neighboring rights is when there isn't an authorship sort of element to it. So that basically relates to the, the rights that PPL are administering. That's neighboring, John, do you wanna, neighboring rights of PPL. That's probably an easy way of, of, of yeah. Yeah. So basically, I, I don't know what the actual term in, um, definition is, but it's basically when there is, it's the rights that relate that are outside of the authorship side of things. So not the person who composed the lyrics, not the person who composed the music, but it's whoever owns the rights in the in the actual recording and whoever performed on that recording. That's the the element of neighbouring rights, but. It, but when we're talking about streaming, it's important to realise or understand that PPL doesn't administer or collect that side of things. So when there's a radio broadcast, that radio it broadcast is going to be of a recording, and therefore that's when PPL will pay, and that's when PRS will also pay. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit more than that, but yeah, that's a good way of sort of similar, uh, or, or, yeah. I mean, the only th important thing, and this is where there's a lot of sort of debate, is that the performer actually isn't getting a cut of that. Yeah. And, and to follow on as well, if you, 
No, 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 that's fine. Um, so, I mean, the royalties, what you're getting from your publisher is not necessarily, oh, yeah, but, but they will give you a mechanicals. So therefore, and they, therefore, any of your streaming income on the mechanical side will be coming via your publisher. Um, if your tracks have been licensed out to a, you know to a label, I don't know whoever you want to pick on, um, you know Domino, Mute, etc., then um, therefore the label has to pay MCPS for the right to use the works that are under the control of the publisher. So your tracks, yeah. So therefore the label pays for an element of that as well. Um, so therefore, if you get out of your deal with a publisher then you need to therefore consider how are you going to get the income that you were getting via your publishing deal. Personally, what I would say is just give us a bell. <laughs> we'll have yeah. a chat about it. Yeah. Yeah. My question's on sampling and how should we approach sampling carefully famous uh, tracks? And then also on the royalty side as well, how, how, how would we literally approach it from scratch? Yeah, I'll, as my voice is going. <laughs> Sampling is, um, is, is a strange one. I heard, uh, we've had a couple of people here um, that, that work here, we do the induction and they said, well, they, they've done like a music degree or something and the lecturers have turned around and said, well, if you use five seconds, it's fine. You know, that's, that's you know, no, copyright theft is copyright theft. Um, so if you're going to sample something, you will need the permission of the rights holder. So it's not something that PPL or PRS will actually deal with from a permission point of view. If you want to use it in a track that you're producing, you will need the permission of that, that rights holder. So you need to approach whether it's the record company, whether it's the, the you know, um, yeah, yeah. Both, it would, yeah, you need both, yeah, yeah. And you will probably have to either pay a fee or, there was a famous case, you've got to be very careful with sampling, there was a famous case of The Verve, and what was the track that they got of the Rolling Stones, they that's it, Bittersweet Symphony. What happened was, <laughs> well, the, the, the version that, that uh, the Rolling Stones took to court, Keith Richards and whatever, um, they agreed that they could use a sample on the track at the start of the track. And of course, they, they used it all the way through the, 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 the song, and it was a huge hit and uh, millions of pounds and all this sort of thing. The problem was that um, the Rolling Stones sort of came along and said, well, hang on, you paid and we agreed that you would only use it on that first part of the track. So all the royalties that you're earning from this are now ours because you, you've, not, you've not kept to, to your agreement. And he went to court. Um, it didn't get to a decision in court because the Verve realized that the Rolling Stones have got it sewn up. <laughs> um, and consequently, they never earned a bean out of that song. It was a huge hit, and they never earned a penny out of it. Um, I think it was about two years ago, the Rolling Stones actually gave them the rights back. So now the Verve are earning money out of it. Yeah, but that's why you've got to be really careful with sampling. Uh, just to add to that, um, two or two things really. I, I suppose it should be fair on the, on the Stones. You know, they probably didn't even know what's going on. They've got business that do that, and the business will follow the money. And that's basically what happens here, you know. So therefore, as creatives, people will collaborate and such like, and therefore, you know, maybe, you know, Richards and, and Jagger, et cetera, will be up for a bit of collaboration. But when, but they have to remember that they're actually going to, they've got to deal with a publisher and the publishers will be on it, you know, as will the labels as well. So therefore, you know, bear that in mind because I hear that a lot, you know, you know the people are, interaction with others agreeing to do things but not appreciating that they've actually signed a publishing deal and the publisher will come knocking could potentially go knocking at the door also you know the as far as sampling goes we have to have a, i appreciate or you know that it happens you know people use it as part of the creative journey and such like and but i suppose the tips are don't use any 
do not go near any major artist, major label, major published sort of act, and to just think about what you would do yourself. If someone's using your music, you want to sort of be rec some recognition for it, so vice versa. Um, you know, work together rather than just stealing, oh, that's the wrong word, but using without clearance or without permission or authority of others. You know, it doesn't hurt to ask. Who knows, you know, you might get the artist actually come back and say, yeah, let's actually get into this and do this seriously. So, you know, work together. Okay, we've got two quick questions because we're about out of time. I know there's a few people that have got questions as well, so you can potentially ask after while we're networking or we can get some contact details, but we're, we are only limited time, so I can't get to everybody. But here's the last two. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to know if my co-writers registered the, the song and it's showing up on my PRS membership portal, does that then mean that I have to go in and register it as well, or is that...? Okay, so if someone has registered the song on your behalf, if the share, if it will appear on your on, on my work section, but if you haven't actually participated in that registration, you don't have to go and do the whole registration again, but what you do need to do is authorise it or confirm to us that you're happy with the shares that have been registered on your behalf. And the way that you would do that is identify the song on the database, click amend work, and then just move through those five stages to the fifth stage, which is to submit and hit submit. So, you know, 30 seconds piece of work, but it's important that you do it. Yeah, and otherwise is if I've registered a piece of work and the other writer hasn't done that, does that mean that I don't get royalties on? No, you'll still get paid, but but they won't. but but it can Im it can impact the correct that they won't, um, and then you could be in a situation where you know you're getting paid, they're not, and they don't understand, and then it's all fingers pointing us. Where actually it's about a process, mm -hmm. so it's just about understanding how to do it. And then also, sorry, just quickly, I did sign up for Centric, and. I've noticed that they've also registered the works on PRS as publisher. So I've got two songs, same title, one just registered as me, but one then one registered as them as the publisher. But they've I've not actually done any work with them. They've you know there's been no opportunities from that. So if I then take myself off centric, will that will that then deregister them as a publisher? Um, in answer to the last bit, yes, it will. Okay. You know, if you sign up with Centric or any other sort of admin publisher, you know, the, one of the benefits of those type of admin deals is that you can get out of them quickly. You know, you, this thirty day cut or two, a month's cut out. So therefore, but you have to notify them. Obviously, the downside is, you know, the pros and cons of everything. Yeah, you know, if you're so, if you're using them, then um, yeah, they're in a sense administering, but ultimately what they're doing is the same as what you would be doing if you've got a membership. That model is more for those people that are not yet at that point where they've joined PRS Direct. But once you're a PRS member, unless they're getting you sync deals, which is part of their deal, um, then you've got to question, where, why do I want to be paying them 20%? Yeah. And that's not aimed at Centric, it's aimed at any of those. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I, on one of the slides you showed um, the amount per minute played, if you played on BBC, radio, TV, um, does that go down to a very small amount? So, for example, if you're played on a news programme with a 10, 20 second excerpt to provide background. Does yeah, no, definitely. Count? That was clearly just to demonstrate what a per minute value. But if you get five seconds, then you'll get five seconds worth of that minute. Fab. Thank you. OK, great stuff. So. Now we're going to have a little performance, but I just want to say thanks again for coming down and sharing your knowledge. Again, you can get a hold of these guys that can share these guys. But thanks, thanks guys. <laughs>